Okay, so coming from the island of Mauritius, which is about a thousand miles off the east coast of Africa, on the other side of Madagascar, in the middle of the Indian Ocean, it's about 30 miles wide, pretty small island. You might have heard of the, uh, the dodo. The dodo uh, was a native bird of Mauritius, which went extinct about 300 years ago. This is a plant that's on the verge of extinction from that same island. This is Nesocodon mauritianus. You can see, notable about this uh, member of the Campanulaceae, the bellflower family, same family as uh, Campanula and Lobelia, is that it's got red nectar, and that's, that's because it's thought to uh, be pollinated uh, by geckos. Okay, there's probably, you know, 40 or 50 of these things left in the world. Okay, so this is, this is a large percentage of the population right here. <clears throat> See, they even got a little guy. Look at this little bastard. All right. Pretty large flower for a uh, companionate. We got a calyx up there. The sepals got the uh, lancet that leaves. Somewhat the dentate on the margins. Almost the succulent stems. And the way that these uh, the seeds were collected, I believe 10 or 20 years ago, uh, you know, they were growing on the edge of a waterfall. You know, most of the, the plant life on the island is extinct because it's, uh, you know, they're... I think the first people arrived in the 1600s and uh, you know they quickly began annihilating the lowland flora to make way for a tropical uh, you know tropical agriculture you know vanilla palms etc and uh, so as a result all that's left are just little crumbs little fragments of uh, biota up in the mountains of native biota okay and this is one of them a lot of a lot of endangered plants I believe there's already you know 70 Five plants from the island are extinct already. So, but you could see, you know, as happens with the, you know, island flora is they, uh, you know, they tend to get the succulents. They tend to grow a little bit bigger, and of course the uh, the seeds uh, lose their long distance dispersal capabilities because, uh, you know, evolution would filter that out. Any any long distance, uh, uh, any seeds with long distance dispersal would just go right out into the ocean. So. The ones that uh, don't fly far away are going to thrive. They're going to thrive more, okay? And that allele is going to be uh, accentuated. But you could see this guy. I mean, look, really, look at that flower. Look, at it's that beautiful bell flower with those... That wonderful venation in the inside of the Corolla right there. You got the nice red nectar. I haven't tried tasting it myself. But uh, apparently it works to get these pollinated by the uh, day geckos that do the job. Real nice uh, case of ex situ conservation right there. Preserving species outside of habitat to breed them and produce seed for eventual uh, reintroduction, you know, should the habitat still be there intact, you know, if the uh, if humanity isn't uh, annihilated it yet. Let's hope. So over here we got a nice uh, Wawichia, Mirabilis. You can see they got the deep pot because those roots go... Uh, Roots go very deep down. If you're gonna, these are very hard to grow. Okay, I've killed one or two. Germinated the seed, they lasted a year, and then uh, they got uh, too cool and too wet and just rotted away. I came out and they were sprouting hairs from the mold. But I mean, these things can live for 2,000 years. Very, very odd plant right here. Native to the uh, fog deserts of uh, Namibia. See the monoecious flowers these are the males the staminate flowers you can see the anthers in there and then down here you can see that the swollen ovary at the base it's a uh, epistolate flower that's the, uh, the female look at that it's a nice uh, nice bristly stigma Here we got another uh, endemic uh, island flora. This one to the island. This one endemic to the island of Hawaii. This is Brighamia insignis, and it's one of the uh, notorious Hawaiian, Hawaiian lobeliads. All right, wonderful case of adaptive radiation, right there. And my friend Tom Givnis, she's done a bunch of work with these, you know, exploring uh, the biogeography of them, and then of course just the the rapid evolution of this whole uh, clade of. Uh, Another Campanulaceae, another Campanulid uh, on the Hawaiian Islands. You can see, look at this, they got a, 
Got a nice uh, cardissiform uh, little trunk right there. They grow on cliffs, very sketchy cliffs on the island of Hawaii. Another island that suffered a uh, undue amount of uh, plant and animal extinctions in the last uh, 100 or 200 years. And then uh, you got this uh, massive uh, old bastard right here, a Morphophallus titanum. You've probably heard it is the corpse flower. Okay, it's a lot of conservatories have uh, specimens of these now. But this is probably the largest one that, that I've personally ever seen in my life. Again, this is all one leaf. This is a monocot. It's in the uh, aeroid family. And that is all one leaf. There is no abscission uh, layer anywhere between any of these uh, little, what you would otherwise call leaflets. So this is all one massive leaf. It's gathering up energy right now. Stashes it in a massive corm. Uh, in this pot, which has probably got to weigh 300, 400, 500 pounds. So I fucking have no idea. It's a heavy pot. And so once that, that, that leaf will die back, once it's gathered enough energy, stashes it in the corn in the ground, and then uh, later on, a massive uh, five-foot-tall flower will come up. And then it'll bloom and smell like rotting meat because it's pollinated by carrion beetles. Uh, you know, I think uh, island of Sumatra is where this is native to. And then... Uh, and it gets pollinated, produces seed, and then uh, goes dormant again, and you know, eventually, you know, we'll go uh, have a couple more intervals of sending up leaves, gather more light, and I'll do it all again. You can see there's a little one back there. I believe that's the same species. Amorphophallus is a lot, rather large genus. It's got uh, quite a few uh, species in it. I have uh, Amorphophallus uh, rivieri uh, in my house, but it's of course nowhere near as big. It's a much more dimin <coughs> diminutive species. I mean, that's, that's got to be 15 feet tall, right there. It's fucking, it's incredible. Okay, now in the same family as that uh, Morphophallus, we got this guy right here from uh, the jungles of Gabon in Africa. This is Ancomanis welwichia, okay? Another aeroid. You can see this one has, uh, the shoots are covered in, <laughs> in, in spines. And there's the, there's the, uh, the fruit right there. Got a rather thick uh, root right there, too. Nice caudex. You can see they're a changing color to attract the animal dispersal agents. Okay, so more from the aeroid dungeon here, and you can see it's quite massive. We got a species of uh, anthurium, this one from Mexico. Uh, quick intro to aeroid flower morphology. You got the spathe, you got the spadix. Female flowers are normally at the bottom, and male flowers are generally at the top. Here's one with the uh, ripe fruits. Quite obvious uh, for bird dispersal. You can see nice uh, bright red color to attract the, the birds that'll disperse it. They'll eat it, and then, of course, shit out the seed. Nice roots too. Oh. You know, many of them, of course, are epiphytic. They grow on uh, on the sides of trees and tree canopies, etc. In very, uh, very uh, humid, hot, humid understories of uh, tropical forests. Okay, and here we go. Here's the uh, cactus dungeon at Missouri Botanical Garden. I'm I'm impressed at how nice these cacti look. They yes, they must use systemic uh, systemics, the neonicotinid pesticides that uh, kill the bees. Okay, but I mean, obviously, you're not going to kill any bees here because there's no bees that can get in here to pollinate these things. But I'm just saying, you know, normally cacti, you know, you get one, you get one, you bring in one individual that's inf infested with mites, you know, and uh, then they just spread to everything and you end up with, they don't kill the plant in most cases. They just make it look like shit with a bunch of scar tissue. I've seen a lot of botanic gardens and conservatories that have that problem, so... You know, and it's because, you know, the, the habitats they grow in, you don't get those mites, in, you know, in most cases. It's such an extreme environment. It's so hot and dry most of the time. Those mites aren't uh, around. But then you bring them into places where they, you bring them into, you know, cultivation. They're exposed to them. Then they get them real bad. You can see, oh, you get some little scarring down there. But, uh, you know, you go to like UC Berkeley's uh, cactus dungeon. They got, they brutal. Brutal, just might because they don't use any systemics there, so you get just massive scarring, and uh, a lot of them look really rough. But this is oh, look, they got the little aerocarpus blooming now, the living stone cacti. 
a little early. These normally in habitat, they normally bloom in November. There you go, you got Aztecium uh, ritteri. Saw that guy in on Nuevo Leon. This guy, I, didn't, I never saw one single one growing on flat ground. They grow in the walls of these cliffs. These, uh, just these, these rock walls. It's, it's technically it's conglomerate. It's composed of, uh, you know, river sediments ancient river sediments but uh, it's pretty pretty impressive got a nice second collection over here another well witchy you see they got to get those deep pots for those guys see that oh some nice uh isoaceae the ice plant family in the genus lithops the living stones a lot of these from the uh the deserts of uh, south africa and namibia you know you get them in dime stores too they're pretty easy to grow is or to cultivate as long as you don't overwater them but they will rot very easily so you know you just let them dry out give them a little bit of water when it's warm if it's cool if it's cool outside or in your house don't water them at all the fuck is this oh my god look at this look obvious isoacea he's got that uh, kind of crystalline outer layer on the epidermal tissue okay which is you know diagnostic of a lot of members of the family but this is a Monalaria pisiformis. See, they got the tag. <laughs> but believe it or not, I didn't know that coming in here. Oh, fuck. Anyway, look at the uh, look at the way the shoots come out, though. Okay, that's a really that's a that's a glorious bastard right there. Holy shit! Isoacea is a very cool family. Very interesting flower structure. Okay, those things aren't the, are not true petals. The little fringy things most of them have on their flowers. Okay, so right here you got the uh, Nymphaceae dungeon. The uh, Nymphaceae, of course, being uh, one of the basal angiosperm families in the Anita grade. Amborella, Nymphaea, Elysium. I forget what the T stands for. And then, uh, ah, fuck, I always, I always forget the, all the uh, letters in that acronym. But uh, the, basically the five plant families that are, you know, they're, taxonomically they're placed right at the base of when... Uh, the lineage is placed right at the base of when a flowering plants first evolved. So very old lineage right here. And you got a nymphaea. Here's a flower. And then over here you got the, just you know, your typical Amazon water lilies in the genus Victoria. These of course can get upwards of 12 feet across. You know, but uh, the, the water's got to be at least 30 degrees Celsius, so it's got to be very warm water. We you got the Victoria Cruziana. You can see it rains a lot where these are native to, as you might have guessed. And so because of that, uh, they've got this little divot in the leaf right there to drain water so it doesn't fill up and sink this whole, uh, this whole leaf. 